Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Brendan Burns of Kuyu on the podcast. He's been on the podcast before and a very popular guest. And today we're going to talk about uh, him and Jason Harrison, the founder of Kuyu's Doll Sheep Hunts. Uh, Brendan and Jason had a, a hunt in the Northwest Territories. Brendan also had a doll sheep hunt in Alaska. And then he capped his unbelievable season off with uh, a tremendous uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn in the state of Montana with a bow. I believe it's the largest uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn ever shot on a wilderness tag uh, with a bow and uh, 190 inch, uh, give or take, ram uh, is an unbelievable feat. And it's going to be awesome to talk to Brendan. Before we get to that, I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for all your support. Uh, you can send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I love hearing from you, questions, comments, people you want to hear on the podcast. I love the interaction with the listeners. So uh, I get multiple emails every single day from you guys, and I just appreciate that. So f- feel free to send me a message if you haven't. Uh, also, you can follow along our adventures at jscottoutdoors on Instagram, my associate Dar Colburn at Dar. That's D-A-R-R Colburn at on Instagram. Uh, also, our website, jscottoutdoors.com. Our YouTube channel. Our YouTube tra- channel is growing each day. We're getting more and more subscribers. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And, uh, of course, our guiding website, Colburn and Scott Outfitters.com. Uh, when you guys hear this episode, it's been preloaded. Uh, I will be in Sonora, Mexico, Uh, taking part in our Gould's turkey hunts down there uh, through our sister company, gouldsturkeyhunt.com through Colburn and Scott Outfitters. And uh, we'll be having a a fun time down there. And um, encourage you guys, if uh, you want to go on a Gould's turkey hunt, to uh, send me a message. Uh, But you can check out our YouTube channel and uh, see all the videos from uh, the turkey season so far, plus all of the uh, Gould's turkey hunt videos when I get back. Uh, guys, again, thanks for your support. I want to thank GoHunt.com Insider uh, for their title sponsorship of this podcast. The GoHunt Insider is by far the most valuable tool a Western hunter could give themselves. They are the industry leader and number one source for Western, Western hunting for a lot of reasons. They have changed the game for how hunts and hunting information is found. Within a matter of minutes, using filtering 2.0, you will be able to filter by state, species, residency, odds of drawing a tag, specific hunting dates, harvest success percentages to find the hunts that fit exactly what you're looking for. If you're a guy that applies all across the West or just in your home state but want to find some new opportunity, there's no better way than doing it using the GoHunt.com Insider. As an exclusive offer to my listeners, if you sign up for an Insider membership for $149 a year and use the J. Scott promo code at checkout, you'll receive a $50 gift card to Kuyu to use towards whatever you'd like. Uh, Go over to GoHunt.com Insider, click on the blue Join Now button, and get yourself the most valuable membership a hunter could have. Guys, let's get right to this episode uh, with Brendan Burns. And I'm sure you guys are going to love it. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a cool episode with the, uh, my friend Brendan Burns, who's the guide and outfit fitter program director for Kuyu. And the last time that we talked with Brendan, he was getting ready for a bunch of sheep hunts, uh, two doll sheep hunts one in the Northwest Territories and one in Alaska. And then uh, he had also drawn a Montana bighorn tag. And Brendan, it's great to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Jay. Appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on. Always always a pleasure. Yeah, this should be fun. Uh, like I said, last time you were just getting ready. You had been preparing all summer uh, for those uh, hunts. And I believe the first one that you went on was Northwest Territories, you and Jason, uh, and I ended up seeing the video of your hunt up there and tell me a little bit about how cool being the last guys in there at Nahanni, um, and getting to hunt up there. And you guys shot two unbelievable rams. 
yeah, it was a, it was a great hunt. Um, they, they're, they're a tremendous operation and it was, you know, it was a, it was a different situation, obviously, to go up there and be some of the last guys ever. To, I, we, I think we were the last people ever to hunt, um, that particular drainage. Um, they, they were basically expanding the Haney National Park and, uh, and we had, we had booked that hunt three years ago when we found out they were, um, a lot of that stuff was going to go away to the park. So, um, yeah, it, it turned out, uh, it was a great hunt. We had, you know, obviously had a great time. Um, it was, uh, the weather was phenomenal. I mean, anytime you can go up and, and, and go into really good sheep country and you have really good weather and, uh, and, and it hasn't been hunted in, in a while, uh, all good things are going to happen. And so, uh, yeah, we, uh, we flew in there and, uh, hunted a great big drain they called Hell Roaring. And it's known for, for really good sheep and they had not hunted it since the previous fall and I've left a couple of big rams in there. And, uh, yeah, the hunt went, went great. We, uh, the first day of the hunt, Jason and I and the two guys, we uh, we went up a, a drain just kind of behind camp, and basically, you know, they they thought the sheep were going to be where where they ended up being. Um, it's always nice when it works out like that. And um, I had drawn that chew gas tag in Alaska, so um, I had to be out of there in about six days was the most I could stay. So uh, Jason was gracious enough to make me the the first shooter and. Uh, yeah, it worked out great. We slid in on a little band of rams that had uh, five or six rams in it, and uh, there was a 12-year-old, 39-inch, just classic-looking NWT doll sheep, and uh, I was able to take him at 105 yards, and that was, uh, yeah, it was really cool. Um, and then uh, two days later, way down the drainage, we found another big old double groomer that uh, Jason was able to take that evening. Um, pretty pretty big grinder of a day to get to him and uh yeah it killed a i think he i haven't got the teeth back on that sheep but it's uh i think it's a it's, it's either 13 13 or 14 year old double broom really heavy old doll ram just a just a kind of a one in a million kind of doll sheep uh you just don't see those full curl and heavily heavily broom you know basically albino looking bighorn uh doll sheep so it was uh yeah it was just a great trip uh, we also killed uh Two two big mountain caribou and uh, so yeah it was a uh, it was it was quick and it was uh, it was good. That's awesome. You know Jason's ram, uh, man, that's like the heaviest looking doll ram I've ever seen. Obviously, I, I haven't been doll sheep hunting, but um, look at a lot of pictures and you know if, if you draw it up, that's I mean that's like a dream ram for sure. Was it one of those rams, Brendan, uh, you know, as soon as you guys saw it, was it like, oh, yeah, that that one's, we got to get that one for sure? Yeah, actually, uh, Jeff and Brady uh, glassed him up. We we had seen him from a long, we, we were going down the, the valley, and they had seen him from a long ways away and didn't quite know what he was, and we got straight across from him and went up the opposite side of the mountain, up in a big rock slide, and, and then we kind of picked him out. And, yeah, you could tell from a long ways away, um, like I said, it looked like an albino bighorn. You just, you know, all sheep, a lot of them get, you know, they have double groomers, which are, which are, you know, heavily beaten off on the ends. There's, there's a lot of, there's, there's quite a few dolls in that type of country that'll, that'll be double groomed. It's pretty rare that one will be, you know, a full curl and broom like that. It's, it's a pretty unique doll ram. So, uh, yeah, I mean, from the, from, you know, several miles below, you could, you could just tell it was, it was a sheep we had to get closer to. And, and once we close the distance, um, you know, especially when we got in close to, you know, sub 300 yards, there was, uh, there was no doubt that was, that was a sheep he had to take. And, and just, you could just tell he was old. He was really skinny. Um, just, just sheep that probably wouldn't have made the winter. Um, and just, you know, everything you look for in a doll sheep, super old, heavy. Um, yeah, it was just a, just a great hunt. I made a, made a cool shot on him and it was just, just a neat setting to, to, uh, to kill a sheep in. It looked like in the video, and I encourage the listeners to go on Kuyu's website, go on their YouTube channel, and, and you can find that video. It's a fantastic video. But it looked like that ram was up on a really cool ledge um, and might have had you guys pegged right there at the last. Um, but he looked so cool right there when Jason shot him. Were you guys able to get right over there to him, or did it take a little bit of uh, uh, fancy footwork to kind of get out there where he was? Yeah, he was he was perched on a, on a basically a big granite flagstone. I'm not sure what what the type of rock was. This big ledge up there, and yeah, he was all by himself, which you know, and obviously he was really really thin, and it was just kind of the end of his run, and so he was just in a really good spot. A lot of escape cover around him. You could tell he just he just didn't want to head head down into any country that he could get in 
you know, any predators or anything around him. So, uh, yeah, we slid, we slid, I think it was about 240 yards below him. And it's funny watching the video, it was a lot steeper than it looks. I mean, it, it doesn't really translate in a film, um, how steep it was, but, uh, yeah, he, he, I don't think he actually pegged us at the end. I think he was just getting up to move around and when Jason shot him. So it was, uh, yeah, but it was, uh, just a cool sheep. And yeah, it was a real scramble to get up to him. And he was perched on, a, you know, I think it was about, six feet wide and 20 feet long, just a big spine sticking out where you could see everything. So it was a, it was a pretty challenging stock. And it was one of those stocks where you're going to get super close before you can see them. You know, you basically come up straight under them and, and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was just a, just a really cool, just a cool sheep and, and uh, everything you could, you could hope for in a golf sheep. It looked like you guys had fairly bluebird, uh, weather when normally you could have, you know anything that type of that that time of year um do the do the sheep really enjoy that sun when they get a chance to get sun yeah you find them way up high you know the, um the, the, we did have really good weather which you know they, they had some horrible weather shortly after we left but uh um but you'll sure take, I've, I've been on enough sheep hunts that had horrible weather that it was pretty nice to to be bluebird and yeah it was you know when i killed my sheep it was probably 60 degrees it was it was beautiful so um, yeah, they're just out being sheep, and you know those areas are so unhunted, um, and especially that one. You know, they they really manage those areas. I mean, they'll they'll pop in there once or twice a year, um, and obviously it won't be hunted again. But um, they they just no, nothing's ever like those sheep are just being sheep. So they're um, they just kind of doing what they do, and uh, yeah, they're they just just like anything. They like to you know when the, when the weather's nice, they take advantage of it too. And it was really green and. Uh, there was a cloud in the sky when I killed my ram, and, and Jason, we got, I think we got rained on once in the five days we were there, so it was uh, obviously nice when that happens. I'm sure it was a little bit bittersweet uh, for you and Jason, but, I mean, I've got to think the outfitter, it's super bittersweet because that's an area that he's hunted for years and, and ended up getting bought out by, I guess, the National Park, and I, I guess he has to, you know, buy another concession. Uh, where did he end up mo moving to? Yeah, so Nahani Butte Outfitters is who we hunted with, and uh, yeah, they basically lost 80% of their area. They they bought another territory north of them uh, that they that they call NWT Outfitters, and uh, it's a great area. Um, they're, they're you know it's a comparable area. They, there's some great sheep up there too. I mean, there's there's no bad areas in the North Coast Territories, but uh, yeah, they basically it it didn't really have, have anything to do with sheep hunting or with uh with outfitting or or land use by hunters or anything it was just it was kind of a bigger issue they they expanded the, the Haney national park i believe from six thousand square miles to thirty thousand square miles so um but Haney butte did keep uh about twenty percent of their area and some of their really good big ram areas too um so they're they're definitely still in operation it's a you know if you get a chance to go hunt there they 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 do a great job they um but uh yeah, it was a uh, it was a bit of a bummer. Um, you know, it's just obviously cool to see that kind of country and and made it a little more more special. To be you know some of the last you know the last guys ever to be in there. So yeah, yeah, for sure, uh, Brendan. For someone out there that's um, looking to go to the Northwest Territories, or or let's actually back up, someone that's looking to doll sheep hunt. Um, are doll sheep hunts uh, typically in the Northwest Territories, are they going to be more expensive than your hunts in Alaska? And uh, if if someone has the means and they were going to go on a doll sheep hunt, would you recommend going on going to the Northwest Territories, or would you recommend going uh, to Alaska, and why? Well, that's that's a it, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, the Northwest Territories is probably the best doll sheep habitat. Um, they have really high numbers of sheep. The success rate is definitely higher than Alaska. Um, it, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, 90 of the biggest 100 doll sheep have been killed in Alaska. I mean, Alaska definitely has bigger doll sheep. You know, they have way rougher country, um, lower density. Um, some of the big ram areas, I mean, there, there's no comparison as far as where the big sheep come from. It's definitely in Alaska. Um, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories have more rolling, kind of gentle, real great habitat um, and, and generally higher sheep numbers, um, higher success rate for sure. Um, Alaska is more competitive. Um, there's not exclude, but the thing about the Northwest Territories and the Yukon is they're exclusive guide use areas. Um, they're, they're allocations. So, um, those areas you're not going to run into other outfitters or, um, 
or many, I mean, like I think in the Northwest Territories, they had uh, under five doll sheep killed by residents total in a year. So um, they're, they're definitely more isolated um, and more exclusive. Um, so it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, in Alaska, you cannot um, hunt with a with a helicopter. Um, in in the Yukon, it's generally horseback or airplane. In the Northwest Territories, there's either there's one operation that's horseback, one that's uh, a couple that are backpack only, Super Cub supported, and then quite a few of them are um, helicopter operations. So it just basically depends on what you're uh, what you're looking for. Um, there the Northwest Territories in Yukon are definitely more expensive than Alaska on average, but it just depends on the area. Um, so it just yeah, it basically, it's, it's kind of a tough question. It, it, it depends. Are you going to go multiple times and, uh, and and what you're personally looking for in a hunt? Yeah, I think that's a, a good explanation there. I want to pick your brain a little bit about uh, judging doll sheep and maybe walk me through uh, some of the things that you use to tell whether it's a ram uh, that you want to harvest or not and kind of your personal criteria uh, maybe from the first doll sheep hunt that you went on till, uh, you know, to the last hunt and kind of what you're looking for personally and, and, you know, what a lot of other people are looking for when they're trying to determine if that ram is something that they want to harvest. Yeah, the, the number one thing I look for is age. I mean, I, I would, uh, I want to kill an old ram. Um, the more I hunt sheep, the more age is the biggest factor. I mean, it's it's definitely... Um, the older the ram, the better the ram, no matter how big he is, in my opinion. Um, when, when you're looking at judging sheep, I mean, kind of the, you know, the measuring stick is, is full curl, you know, which is all the way around and comes above the nose. Um, basically, if you look at it from the side, it would make a full circle. Um, so that, that's kind of the benchmark. I mean, legal rams in, are, are basically anything eight years or older, full curl or broomed. Um, it's just, it, it kind of depends on what you're looking for that. I found myself, um, the ram I killed in the Hanny is just a beautiful, uh, slightly tipped out 39 inch, 12 and a half year old, just a, just a beautiful, typical doll looking doll sheep, a really clean looking ram. <laughs> and, um, which varies quite a bit, you know, like from one Jason killed or, or the ram I took in Alaska. Um, I, I'm looking for, for me personally, age is the thing that, that I look for, but, um, there's a lot of different things that come into play. Um, how deep they drop, how far out they swing, how wide they are. Um, some areas are known for, uh, you know, deeper dropping, heavier rams. Some come off the back of the head differently. I mean, it, it just depends where you're hunting and, and, and what you personally like. I mean, I, the uglier, I, I've, I've found myself recently, you know, basically the uglier and older the ram, the better for me. Nice. I like that. Uh when you're talking about hunting um, doll sheep, uh, what would you say, and I know it varies across the board, but, um, you know, when we're talking about deserts and Rockies down here in, in, you know, in the Southwest, we're constantly talking about bases. And just give me kind of a ballpark of, you know, a mature, let's say eight years or older, uh, a doll sheep is going to have, you know, kind of give me a range of bases that they will have. Yeah, generally doll sheep will run from, you know, 12 inches to a big, big doll ram will be 15. I mean, that's that's a monster. Um, there's been bigger taken, of course, and there's smaller taken, but you're looking for 12 to 14 would be the range. You know, there, there's a lot of really nice rams that are killed that are, have 12-inch bases, um, and, you know, 14 is on the top end, 15 would be a giant. Um and then, you know, from lengths, you're looking at uh, a legal sheep. Can it be anywhere from, you know, 31 to, you know, 45? Uh, I would say probably the average sheep taken is, you know, a, a good old mature ram is, you know, around 35. 35 by 13, I bet, you know, and I have no scientific evidence to back it up, but I bet that's probably about the average of a of a good solid mature doll ram, um, you know, the longer and the better. Uh, or, or the heavier the better, but uh, you know that's probably about average, I would guess, on a, on a legal mature ram. What is um, Boone and Crockett minimum score for a doll sheep? All time book is 170, and to put it in perspective, an all time book doll sheep, uh, an all time book doll sheep would be the equivalent of 
a two, uh, uh, are as rare as a, a non-typical mule deer, you know, two, two four. So in other words, in other words, then, and now it's going to go to my next question of, you know, quote unquote, are the best days of doll sheep hunting behind us as far as large trophies and, and to, to further that, is that more just because there's the hunters are better, the outfitters are getting better, and the rams are not uh, getting to, you know, grow up and be as old uh, as maybe, you know, the wonder years of, of doll sheep hunting? Yeah, I would say the, doll, the I mean, if you look through the book, they're, they're not killing as many dolls, you know, great big monster rams as when they opened up Alaska and the Yukon with, with a super cub in the, you know, 50s, 60s, and early 70s, but there's still some giants being taken. I mean, there was a 176-inch ram killed in Alaska this year. I mean, they killed they kill a lot of really big sheep in Alaska this fall, probably, you know, five or six over 170, which is which is pretty remarkable. I mean, that's that's a lot of big sheep. So um, management comes into play, and, and sheep just come in, you know, they cycle. So it just depends on um, some, some years there's more, some years there's less. There was a few taken in the Yukon. I don't know of any book sheep that were killed in the northwest territories um but yeah there was some some big rams taken this year but definitely the heyday you have to you know consider when when guys really started hitting it hard when when guys had started having access to super cubs and um and stuff like that in the in the 60s and you know 50s 60s and 70s and the early when, when not many people were doing it you know yeah makes sense uh let's take a break here and then i want to ask you about your alaska adventure Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. Brendan, you had an awesome hunt in the Northwest Territories, but you had also drawn a Alaska uh, rifle doll sheep hunt. And I'm curious if you had been in this particular unit before and maybe what your expectations going into this hunt were and kind of how the hunt unfolded. Yeah, I drew a, uh, a Chugach doll sheep keg, um, and the Chugach is broken into a bunch of different units, and, and the unit that I had drawn was not what you would consider the premium unit. It's, it's good. It was it was good. It was better uh, definitely in in years past. It had some tough winter kill uh, in, in 12 and 13, so it was a pretty good unit in the past. This year, uh, the year I drew it, it definitely was not in the heyday of when you'd want to have the tag I, I had drawn. Um, but you know, when you're playing your odds and, and you really just want to hunt sheep, that's, it was a, it would definitely had a little better odds than some of the other areas. So, um, I had not been in the area. Um, it's a walk-in only area. I drew a rifle tag that was, uh, it was a, I believe it was a 12 day season. Um, I think it's the 12th or the 10th through the 20th, maybe it was a two week season, 12th to the 10th through the 24th. Um, something like that. Uh, so it, it's a walk-in only tag. Um, and my expectations were I, I had to, an archery tag in 2012 in the Chugach. It was a really tough hunt. Got some horrible weather. It was an October hunt, and I did not kill a sheep. So my expectations were, you know, going to go in and hunt it as hard as I could, and we're, uh, we were going to see what turned up. There, the biologist said there was not a lot of big legal rams in the area. Um, again, it had 
a bad winter kill, I think, in 12 and 13. So we just basically started at one end, and, and we're going to go in and, and, and find every sheep we could and hopefully turn up something that was uh, – that was that was big and old. When you go into a hunt like that, not really having great, um, you know, the expectations were kind of low um, from the intel that you had gotten. Um, how do you just, what do you do? Prepare yourself to say, I just want to cover as much ground as I can. I want to see every sheep that I can and, and hopefully we'll find a mature ram to harvest. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you got a sheep tag in your pocket, and uh, yeah, we just start at one end, and we're basically going to go walk. Um, it's it's a beast of a hunt. I mean, the area I drew it's it's a it's a six and a half mile, couple thousand foot incline just to get to the edge of the unit, um, and it's about as rugged of area as you could possibly ever hunt sheep in. I mean, the chugach is nasty. It's brushy. Um, we had basically two big uh, drainages we were going to hunt. Um, so yeah, we were, the game plan was, uh, take as much food as possible and possibly get an airdrop towards the end if we needed more. Um, the, the area I was hunting is half in Chugach State Park and half out. So once we got out of the state park, you could get some air assist so we could get a, a food drop, which is kind of a nice thing, but it's a pretty remote area. Um, so we, yeah, you basically just packed all our stuff up and went in there and we're just going to see how it turned out. Hopefully we could turn up a big a big round. Um, you know, like I said, my expectations were something old. Um, so I, I, I didn't have any. Um, there's some of the premium areas in the Chugach where you're going and you're looking for a 160 type dollars keep or something. I, I didn't have that. I was, I, we were just looking to see what we could turn up. And how many rams did you end up seeing? We found basically what the biologists could, we confirmed what the biologists had told us. We, uh, we saw about 15, I think we saw 15 to 20 rams under six years old. We saw about 40 ewes, I believe. I'd have to check my notes, but, um, it was not great. Uh, we, there were, there were some up and coming sheep, but, uh, it was not, it was not great. We walked for four days before we, um, we glassed the ram that I ended up, uh, that we ended up hunting. Um, he was up on top of a big glacier about a day and a half hike from when we saw him on day four. And we were already pretty far into the area. It seemed like we had side hilled about, mm, I don't know, 20 plus miles to the right, and about 60 degrees. So uh, we were a long ways in by the time we found a big sheep. I, th- yeah, I think we turned him up the fourth morning, um, that ram that I ended up hunting. So side hilling to get into this area, um, what boots were you wearing and how do you, how do you prepare your feet? Cause that's a pounding. How do you prepare your feet for something like that? Um, you gotta have boots that are broken. Um, I was wearing Scarpas, um, a sort of full synthetic boot. Um, and I, uh, to, to basically just having your feet be in shape. I, I, you know, again, I don't like to let my feet get out of shape. I'm wearing boots all the time. I wear boots to shows in the wintertime. Um, I just like to keep my feet in shape from getting soft. Um, I do wear two pairs of socks all the time, super thin sock and then a, then a heavier outer sock, which has helped me, uh, prevent blisters and, and kind of keep your feet in shape and, and your feet are going to get tired. I mean, especially in, in something like that where you're, where you're side healing a lot and it's, it's really rugged country. You're, you're going to get tired. I mean, it's just part of the game. Um, keeping your feet as dry as possible is, is really the key to preventing blisters in that kind of country. And especially when you're doing a lot of climbing. So, um, that's, that's what I, that's, that's my philosophy. Are you rotating your socks every single day? Depends on how wet they get. Depends on what you're doing. Um, I think I took three sets of liners on that one and two pairs of regular socks. So I was rotating quite a um, quite a bit. Um, and yeah, it just depends. I just just keep an eye on it. Um, generally, every day. Obviously, um, going in side hill in that much country. Are you carrying trekking poles? Are you carrying one? Are you carrying two? Um, or a walking stick? What are you using? Yeah, so in the Northwest Territories, I put I took uh, trekking trekking poles, two of them, and on the Chugach hunt, uh, this was a glacier hunt, so we we definitely were going to see some ice, we're going to see some really steep country. Where uh, so I took a I took an ice axe on that one, um, a single ice axe um, worked great. I've got a Petzl Snowscopic that they they've actually quit making them now. I've got two of them, and hopefully I never break them or run out of them. But uh, 
yeah, I took an ice axe on that hunt and just to just to keep your balance and you know, uh you may have to, you know, self arrest on a glacier, which is, you know, basically catch yourself falling or something like that. So it uh I always take an ice axe on those kind of glacier glacier hunts and, and they're real handy for, you know, chipping out a place to put set your tent and you know, all that. They're uh you know, two, two trekking poles is nicer, but once you get to really, really steep terrain, uh, I, f- I found an ice axe to be more helpful. Uh, what pack did you use uh, for both hunts? I, I took our Icon Pro 7200. Um, that's a pack I use on any any hunt that I'm doing that's more than five days, and especially if you're taking big glass, that's that's the pack I take. Um, you can shrink it down as small as you you need it, but you know again when you're carrying, you know your hunting gear, sleeping bag, sleeping pad, tent, and multiple days worth of food, you're uh, you're, you're going to fill it back like that up to where um, you know, and then the potential of coming out with a ram, uh, that's that's the pack I take the biggest pack we make. So, which sleeping bag um, do you take when you're in the when you're going on that, say, doll sheep hunt in Alaska, are you taking a 15 degree or are you taking a zero or 30 or what? Yeah, it, it depends. I always check the weather on any hunt I'm doing um, to see what what you could what you could run into. Like in the Northwest Territory, that took a 30 degree. It looked like it was going to be great weather. We were um, we were going to have a nice, comfortable camp. Um, so I took a 30 degree on that one. Um, in the Chugach, I took a 15 degree and a full super down system. So I have a super down pants and super down jacket. So, you know, if it gets colder than that, you could sleep in it and be comfortable. But, uh, yeah, and I, I don't, I don't particularly sleep, uh, warm. So uh, I, I like to over bag if I, uh, if, if there's any question I take, I, I bag up. Uh, right on. And what sleeping pad do you use, Brendan? So I'm using there's a couple of different I I'm always testing new stuff out and kind of seeing what what the latest and greatest is. Um, on I like the uh, the Xped Sin Mat. Excuse me, the the Xped Sin Mat. Uh, so it's a big vertical baffle um, sleeping pad. You know, big four inch baffles. It, it, you sleep really really well at night. Or I'll take the uh, the Thermarest Neo Air. Um, I'm not sure which model. I've got a I got a few different models of the Neo Air. I uh, I do like that uh, sleeping pad quite a bit too. Um, just depends on the thermal break you need. The the Xped Sinmat has got uh, synthetic insulation in it, so it breaks the ground a bit. And then I, I, the Neo Air I'm using has uh, is the wintertime one. It's the silver with the reflective and a and an insulation break in it. So just depends. Um, the Xped's a little easier to blow up, um, and the Neo Air packs a little smaller. So it just depends on the hunt. Gotcha. And I know, um, Kuyu, you've been an integral part of obviously testing Kuyu's gear. Uh, which tents uh, did you guys take on, on these two hunts? So in the Northwest Territories, we used the Mountain Star uh, two-person tent. It's a, the three-season tent. Obviously, we're going to have nice weather. Um, we're expecting, you know, snow, rain, uh, rain in heavy capacity. And and you know it's it supposed to be pretty nice. I mean, when we looked at the weather, and, and so I took that. That's a three-season tent. And then uh, in the two gas, I took our new um, tent that we call the Storm Star. It's, it, it was a prototype that we've been working on for quite a while. I've used it for the last year and a half um, in the in the final stage of, of development. And that's what we took. And, and a hunt like the Chugach, where you could just get some of the worst weather, and we did have some awful weather. Um, you got to take a four-season tent. I mean, the, the wind can be vicious you're going to get um some heavy heavy rain uh which i did experience on that hunt it was it was just a complete opposite hunt of what the northwest territories was so uh we took a four season ten in, in there for those listeners uh, i want you to tell the listeners out there how to kind of manage uh moisture inside the tent um and and how you uh you know you've probably seen bad situations and how uh, your experience has led you in that new storm star to um, be able to manage the uh, moisture inside the tent. Yeah, moisture management really comes into, into play when, when you're in a static environment that has almost no air moving. Um, if you've got high wind, uh, moisture management is generally not a big problem. Um, high humidity, 
no wind is when it gets probably about as bad as you can get. Um, sometimes I'll take a small camp towel um, if you're really worried about it. Um, but, you know, again, you just, a lot of it is setting your tent up in the right spot, you know, setting it, you know, typically uphill and maybe a bit into the wind, keeping your vents open. Um, you know, just making sure you set it in a spot that doesn't have a ton of, if you can, that doesn't, you know, that isn't absolutely soaked um, to where it's coming below you. And then, uh, you, know, you keep your tent as vented as you can. Um, but, you know, you're going to, you're going to deal with, that's why you use, you know, you have, you know, water resistant down and, um, you, you, you try and keep everything as dry as you can. It's, it's, it's just, it's a struggle sometimes. Uh, like I said, especially when there's no air movement whatsoever and you're spending long periods of time, you know, a couple of days in a tent, um, you just got to keep it tented and, you know, and, and like I said, when you do get good breaks in the weather, you just open up your tent and, and, and get some airflow in there and, uh, you just try to keep track. You just trying to, you basically just want to keep up on it. Um, and a lot of it's the tent design, you know, I mean, it, it, the tighter the tent, especially when you're hunting with two guys, if you have, uh, uh, you know, it's the, the smaller the tent, the tighter the space, the more moisture you're going to deal with with your breath. And then especially once it gets towards, if it's really, really cold, um, it, it becomes a, an issue too uh, because, you know, your breath, you're exhaling, you know, um, when you exhale, you're, 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 you're adding moisture there all the time too. So basically just keeping up on it, um, keeping your tent vented. And uh, yeah, just trying to trying to can trying to set your tent in the right spot always helps. And when you say setting your tent in the right spot, off the top of your head, what would automatically jump out as the wrong spot? Um, in a really low area, especially you know, I mean, if you're, it, it depends on. It, it, it kind of, I mean, you, you kind of camp where you have to, no matter what. But you know, you, I, I tend to, you know. Put your tent on a slight angle, um, especially facing uphill, um, a bit into the wind um, to where you're, you know, where the, the air movement is going to going to get inside your tent a bit. Um, and then, you know, out of areas that are that are, you know, if you can you can stay out of an area that's wet below you. That's 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 ideal. Um, now, not not every time you can you can do that, but uh, you know, a lot of it too in the tent is you know make, making sure you don't pull tons of wet stuff that you're wearing um, into the tent. Uh, with you, and, you know, if you're going to sleep stuff dry or whatever, just 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 always being cautious of where anything that's wet or anything that's uh, um, that's going to bring moisture into your tent is at. What about um, there's guys that kind of say that you know you go with the tent without a floor. W what are your thoughts on that? You know, the floorless shelter thing I have used quite a bit. I I don't particularly like them uh, myself that's just my opinion um, I, I find that they they rain a bit on the inside especially if there's um, high moisture content in the ground you know that that's going to evaporate and, and, and stick on the outside of the tent I uh, I, f I find you're going to end up packing enough stuff to keep yourself dry um, to put under you to keep you off the floor the, the, the floorless shelters are really nice I don't know the the single wall stuff. If if you have you know a stove with you and and you have um, wood you can burn to keep it dry. But um, on a on a sheep hunt like uh, like you know like in the shoe guest for example, I would I would never take a shelter like that. So that hunt in the Chugach, uh how many days uh, did it last uh, until you killed your ram? And um, tell me about the ram because I he's. I've seen the pictures. He's unbelievable, Ram. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We, uh, yeah, so like I said, we we rolled into the area and and just basically we're gonna start at one end and and survey the whole thing and and hike as far as we had to to find the sheep. And on the fourth day, we were at the basically in an area that kind of the point of no return and uh, in the middle of the area. And we were sitting up on the top of the ridge and there was a, a a sheep we could see from a long ways away, <clears throat> sitting on top of a below below a glacier and. Uh, yeah, you, we could tell from a long ways away it was a big ram. We couldn't really tell what was going on with his head. Um, it, it definitely wasn't a typical, you know, big old doll sheep, curly kind of looking ram. But we could tell it was a mature ram. And it was about a day and a half hike from where we were at to get to him. But we didn't really have anything better to go on. So we decided that we were going to commit and kind of go that way. And, uh, yeah, a uh, day and a half later we basically got, got under him and found him. And it was uh, it's basically a big 
um, non-typical doll sheep. He was uh, he, he'd been either sick or injured when he was young, and uh, he's got a really short horn on one side that had that had shelled part of the core, core uh, that had shelled part of his horn um, at a younger age, and then the other side was uh, it was deformed and was kind of growing next to his nose. It was just a just a really cool old ram. And the instant I saw it up close, I, I knew that was a sheep I'd come there to hunt. And uh, yes, yeah, so we. Uh, he was living in an area that basically was unaccessible. You couldn't, we couldn't, you couldn't recover him if you did shoot him, and uh, we couldn't get up there to him for any reason. So we basically just had to sit there and wait him out. Um, and so we we waited, I think, four days um, for him to come down. And uh, I think on the on the morning of the fourth morning, we went up to watch him after sitting there watching him every day, and he was gone. And so we kind of looked at all the exit routes he could have went. And we kind of guessed that he had dropped over the backside of that mountain, and uh, there's a big glacier valley that was behind it, kind of above the toe of this glacier. And we swung around there, and uh, and that's where he was. He'd come down to get something to eat, and the fog was moving up. And um, basically, uh, we just caught him at the right time. He was headed back to his perch after having a grabbing something to eat, and made a couple pretty good shots on him, and uh, and and got him. And uh, it was just just a just a really tough, challenging hunt with some awful weather and, you know, nothing really kind of went our way. We put a lot of miles on and it was, uh, yeah, just a really cool round to kill. And it was probably the, it was a, it's a fifth, I had his teeth cut. He's uh, he's a 15 year old doll sheep, um, which is unbelievable. It's just a dream ram. And he's, he's basically a non-typical. He's probably the shortest sheep killed in Alaska. He's only 19 by 29, uh, full curl on his short side. And just a, you know, just an absolutely unique doll ram that uh, uh, couldn't be happier with him. And, uh, yeah, one of those sheep that you just, there's only one in the world that'll be like him, that's for sure. That, yeah, he's a really, really cool looking ram. Uh, let's take a quick break here. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope. That's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com or on Instagram at PhoneScope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order. Brendan, you also had drawn in your home state of Montana, and uh, you you've actually guided for the largest bighorns, you know, the, the biggest bighorns that, that, that Montana produces. What was it like to draw your own Montana bighorn tag in your home state? Yeah, it was unbelievable. You know, this, this, this last year was, it, it was amazing. I mean, you, you plan for years and years and you, you put an application strategy together and, and, and sometimes it just comes at once. Um, and, and that was what happened last year. I do that shoe gatch tag and then, uh, I drew a big horn tag here in Montana and been 25 years of flying and, uh, it was unbelievable to, you know, to look at the computer and see your name on it, um, on a, on a tag. So yeah, it was a tremendous opportunity. Um, one that I'll probably never get another, another chance at. It was, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's just amazing. You know, you, you plan for it, you dream about it and then, uh, you know, it becomes a reality and, uh, yeah, it does happen to some people. So I was, I was definitely unusually lucky last year. That's awesome. And uh, your bighorn that you harvested is the largest archery ram killed in North America in 2015. And I believe it's the largest ram ever shot in the wilderness, is it not? Yeah, it's one of them. Um, I'm not, again, there could be something else I don't know of or, uh, you know, that's, that's what I've been, you know, I, I, I entered it. So it's, uh, that's, that's, that's what I've been told. So it was uh, certainly my biggest sheep and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it was it was definitely a unique opportunity. Um, it's not an area known for great big sheep, um, so it was pretty cool to go. I've always I've always dreamed about hunting uh, kind of the you know Montana's known for these giant rams. We kill them 
um, in some areas that are it's no secret where the where the areas are. And so the area I had been applying for for a long time and uh it's just not known for big sheep. And so to have a great big ram in there um and and draw a permit was uh was just awesome. I I wanted to ask you about um you know how do you go about finally drawing the tag and then how do you set a strategy for you know there's there's a particular ram or how how do you set your sights and say this is what I want to shoot and I'm going to push myself all the way to the end if that's what it takes to harvest uh, the ram that I'm looking for whereas I think a lot of people they get excited they draw a sheep tag and you know tons of people are done in the first day or two yeah, it just depends on your situation also. You know, I, I killed a, a really big big horn in New Mexico. Um so I was in a pretty unique position that I already had a really nice ram. Um and then I the the area I drew a sheep my sheep tag for, um a really good friend of mine, Robbie Doctor, had had found a big ram three seasons before on the winter range. So we knew there was a great big ram in there. Um and so my goal going into it was to find that sheep. And it's not an area that Produces a lot of big rams, so uh, it, basically the, the goal was I was going to gamble with my tag until late in the year. I was going to go try and find one this one ram in particular. If if he was still alive, um, you know he's on the outer edge of where how how long big horns live. And uh, but yeah, it was it was one of those things too where I, I just really didn't want to hunt the end. I mean, I when I found the sheep that I wanted to to hunt, that was that was one thing. But I, I definitely was not in a rush to. Uh, to have the experience then, you know, you're probably never going to get to do it again. And I've been more lucky than, than most, you know, to have two big horn tags. So, um, yeah, I just basically went in with it, with a, with a goal of finding one particular sheep. And, uh, you know, hopefully I could, I could have turned him up and, and I really wanted it basically thoroughly inventory the area. And my goal is to see every single ram and kill the biggest ram in there. Um, and I, I figured this would have been the biggest ram and, and I just got, got lucky and put a lot of miles on and spent a lot of time in there and uh, got lucky in the fact that he was still alive and, and turned him up. How many days or what day did you kill on? How I many days on, did you hunt it? Yeah, I killed him on the 24th, yeah, um, between scouting and hunting. Tw- I spent 24 days in there. Yeah, so it was, uh, I turned him up on the 23rd day um, and it covered a lot of miles. I'd seen a lot of sheep. Uh, and I, I knew I was basically missing one band of rams and so I, uh, I finally you know, finally turned them off. I actually heard them popping heads in the timber and uh, set up the class and ended up, uh, ended up finding them. Still though, I mean, you're talking about a big area and I think people listening really need to listen to what Brendan's saying. So you, you knew that there was a big ram in your unit and you said, I want to look at every ram in the unit, which is something that I heard you say before when you're talking about your doll sheep. You want to find as many sheep as you can. You want to evaluate as many sheep as you can, inventory as many sheep as you can. But still, Brendan, I mean, y- y- you know that maybe this big ram's alive, but he could be dead. Y- your mind had to be playing tricks with you. How do you stay mentally tough and focused to say, you know, until I see that ram, or find him dead, I'm going to pretend like he's alive and I'm going to stay on him and keep going. How, how do you, there had to be times or maybe a ram that you saw and you thought, man, I could end this and, you know, it, you know, it'd be over with. How do you, how do you stay mentally tough to, to stay on track? Well, you just got to kind of, and again, it, it really depends on your situation. You got to, I, I saw some other good rams, nothing in, in the caliber of this, of the ram that I killed, but, um, uh, basically, I, I just I was just having a great time, and there was plenty of sheep around. I wasn't worried about getting around. I think a lot of people are real concerned, like, am I going to get one? You know, we have a 90-day season in Montana, um, and the area I, I was hunting, you know, has their sheep show up late on the winter range. I, I did not want to kill. I had a few goals. One was I wanted to find the biggest ram in the unit that I could kill, and I didn't really want to hunt them. On the winter range, I wanted to hunt them in 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 the in the wilderness. I wanted to hunt it in in real sheep country with granite under my feet, and you know. Um, so I, I basically it was it was a tough hunt. I, I, it's funny. I I I told everybody like it was a really physically exhausting hunt, but it wasn't hard. And and the fact that I had a smile on my face the whole time to have that opportunity, um, which most people are not going to get, was just was just amazing. So it was 
yeah, it was lots of miles and it was tons of glassing and it was lots of time. I spent 18 days alone um, in there looking for sheep, but it, it, it wasn't hard. It was just, uh, it was amazing. I mean, you had a smile on my face the whole time. It was just, just good hunting. And uh, I was seeing enough sheep to where I knew I was, I, I was never concerned about getting one. Um, it's just about getting the right one. Um, and I, I basically was going to gamble with my tag and, until I found uh, this ram or confirmed that he was dead. I mean, I, I figured if I found enough sheep, I'd know I've seen every sheep in the area, um, and he just didn't make it. So, uh, fortunately, I found him. So, the day that you saw the ram, tell me how that went down. Um, you know, start from, you know, when you woke up that morning, when you found that ram, how did it, how did it shake out, what time was it, and, you know, what did you see first? How did it go? Well, I had uh, I'd written in there two days before with a with a good friend uh, named Rick French, who basically called me and I, I kind of told everybody wh- when I drew the tag, like, if you want to go sheep hunting, let me know. You know where I'll be. I'll be sheep hunting. And so uh, I got a hold of Rick had called me and said he had a few days off and wondered if I wanted to go in on horseback, which I had been on foot almost the whole time. So uh, I said, yeah, it'd be cool. We we're gonna look at some different countries. So. Um, we got snowed on one night, uh, the next day it was fogged to the ground, couldn't see anything, and then uh, the next night, the next day after that, we woke up in the morning, we heard some, some rams popping heads in an area where I hadn't hadn't turned up any sheep. So, uh, yeah, we basically just started glassing, and cutting the timber apart, and uh, and found a little band of rams, and, uh, and it wasn't very long after, and I, I identified the ram that I ended up killing, which we had nicknamed the frame. Um, so, um, yeah, basically found them, and then... Uh, Sat on him all day. Um, they were in a they were in a big chute headed up uh, headed up part of this mountain. They were just feeding, just kind of being were being sheep. You know, there was no they were just just doing what they do. So I uh, I waited till the evening that night, and I was gonna you know I, I obviously found the sheep that I was after, so I was pretty excited. And that evening I waited till the wind started coming straight down, and uh, still hunted across um, the drainage into those rams with the wind in my face and got kind of basically slid, slid right in on them. And, uh, all, it was funny. The ram that I was, that I, uh, that I am killing was just a really old sheep. He was just an old, lazy old ram. And all the other rams in the band, uh, I could have killed with my bow that night. They all fed by me at 42 yards. And the ram that I was after laid at the bottom of the, of the chute and just, you know, it was kind of an old guy just decided he wasn't going to come up. And so those sheep all came up by me. 42 yards, fed for an hour or so, and then fed back down and, and went down to get some water, and they all kind of left, and so I backed out that night, um, which was kind of a bummer. I, th- I, I thought I was going to kill him on the first stock, and uh, so we went back to camp that night, and uh, I had called my, uh, my buddy Robbie from the satellite phone, and, uh, who had originally found the sheep, and said, hey, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him in the next couple of days. I mean, we found him. He's in a good spot. I'm pretty confident I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrow this round in the next couple of days, so... He came in that night. Rick had to leave, unfortunately, and so uh, found him again the next morning, um, put him to bed, sat on him all day, uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it got really, really windy, and the sheep moved kind of into some cover, which was a, which was a great place to, to stalk them. And, I, uh, yeah, it was funny. We were just sitting there watching them, and all of a sudden they moved into a place and bedded down. He had four other rams with him, and, just one of those places where you look at it and you go, I can kill that ram right there. And, uh, yeah, I was basically within bow range of him in about 30 minutes. And, uh, he, I, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but they, they cut my wind a little bit or something and jumped up and, uh, able to make a great shot on him. And that was all she wrote. So that's awesome. And your ram's 13 years old. And, uh, tell me about some of his measurements. Yeah, he's, he was thir- 13 and a half years old. It was, uh, yeah, pretty, Cool stat. He's definitely he was the oldest ram killed in Montana this year out of uh, about 160 rams, which is uh, just something I think is really cool. And uh, yeah, he's, he's 42 by 39 and six by 15 seven on the base. Carries his mass really well. He's uh, 191 gross, um, 189 and five eighths net. Just a just a big old monster sheep. Um, he's got a really beautiful look. Cool cool old cape and uh, yeah, it was just cool to cool to kill a ram I was after. And uh, yeah, I mean. He'd been my ringtone on my phone for for two years before I uh, before I killed him. So it's just a, just a pretty cool hunt for for a great big ram. 
That is incredible. Brendan, how many sheep have you killed in your lifetime? Uh, I've killed six rams now, yep. Three three dolls, a stone, and two bighorns. Nice. That's awesome. So you just need the desert to complete your Grand Slam? Yep. Yeah, desert. I fly everywhere, and uh, yeah, one of these days I'll get lucky. And um, You know, the Grand Slam would be a, is, is a cool thing, and I eventually will, you know, I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to do that, but Right now, I'm just I'm just focused on going and doing as much sheep hunting as I possibly can. I, I love hunting. Uh, I love backpack hunting sheep wherever I can do it. So hopefully, I'll add a few more dolls and, and stones until uh, until my desert tag comes. And uh, as far as bighorns, my luck has been pretty darn good. I'm uh, I'm preparing for a pretty big dry spell on the bighorns. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take another quick break here to hear from our sponsors. Tired of relying on out-of-date numbers, spending too much on hunting consultants and seeing too little results? With Go Hunt Insider, the old way of doing things is over. With the introduction of draw odds and filtering 2.0, you'll have access to the most accurate, up-to-date information in the industry. You can filter by state, species, trophy potential, weapon, specific days or months of the year, harvest success rate, male-to-female ratios, and much more. All of this leads to easily finding the best hunt for you. So what are you waiting for? Visit GoHunt.com slash Insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Brendan, you talk about, I heard you say application strategy, and it sounds like you've drawn some great tags um, what is your application strategy, and you know, did, you know, what what kind of plan do you have uh, with your application strategy, and and maybe for all types of animals? Yeah, um, it's one of those things where I I definitely am not going to tell everybody my application strategy because it wouldn't be much of a strategy, but I, uh, I I definitely have a plan that I go about, and you know, if anybody's looking to um, to, to draw stuff or to, or to have the opportunities, it's it's kind of a it's a multifaceted thing. I mean, you have to look at, you know, are are you going to book some hunts? Um, wh- where are you going to apply? What are what are your goals in those in, in the hunts that you're applying for? Um, what other opportunities are out there? Um, my my strategy. I mean, I, I love to hunt elk and I love to hunt sheep and I love to hunt goats, and those are the three things I've focused on. And so I, I apply everywhere for every one of those animals. Um, my strategy has changed over the years, but I'm always looking at, you know, odds and, and, and talking to, you know, whoever the experts are in, in, in their particular state or my state. I'm always out scouting here in Montana. You know, the, the fact that I got to hunt that big ram was, was r- really just keeping, keeping my ear to the ground and, uh, you know, to, have kind of a sleeper area that had a huge sheep in it and, and really nobody else to know about it. That was, that was, uh, you know, a real coup on my part to, to draw that permit. Obviously, there's a lot of luck involved in drawing tags, but there is some, there's some strategy to it. I, uh, <clears throat> I've got a couple older mentors, guys that have, you know, drawn a bunch of tags in, in their life that I've, uh, that I've really picked their brain on and, and kind of applied what, what they've used, um, to increase my opportunities. And, and like I said, you, you stay positive and, and you just can't give up. I mean, I've been applying since, um, not as long as some, but, uh, you know, since about 2003 for basically everything, everything that would be important for me to hunt, I've been applying for, um, since then. And, and it's just a, it literally is a, it's a game of stats. You, you apply and play your odds as much as you can. And eventually you're going to get lucky. I'm, I mean, I've drawn, if I want a snow sheep hunt in a drawing, I've drawn, uh, a big horn and two doll tags. So it's, uh, you know, I've drawn four sheep tags and, um, which is, you know, basically, you know, there's some luck involved for sure. And, and, I definitely wouldn't say there isn't, but, uh, you could definitely put the luck on your side by, uh, by developing a good, a good plan. 
Yeah, it sounds like you ha do have a good plan. Uh, Brendan, you introduced me to a friend of yours and mentor, uh, Mr. Ray Alt, and I I've just grown to love that guy. I got to spend some time with him in Western Deserts. He comes down here in the winter and and uh, looks at sheep and looks at rocks and, and uh, enjoys the sun. And uh, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your relationship with Ray and, and um he, he's an unbelievable guy, uh, winning the Ishii Award, and uh, uh, just uh, talk to me a little bit about Ray. Yeah, I was fortunate to race from the same town I'm in, and uh, back in the day, I, had, uh, you know, I've, I've always been a guy that, you know, when you when you hear about guys that are very successful, you go uh, you go talk to them and go figure out how they did it. And uh, I'm a big believer in mentors. I've had some uh, some great mentors in my life that have helped me out, so. Um, yeah, race from my hometown. He, uh, the term legend gets thrown around a lot. This guy is a legend for sure. Um, he killed the first world record. He killed the, he killed the world record big horn with a bow in 1968. It was the first Boone and Crockett sheep taken in modern time with a bow. He killed an unlimited area in Montana, which is just unbelievable. And, uh, yeah, I went and basically knocked on his door about 15 years ago and, uh, just said, hey man, you know, you, you, you kill a lot of sheep, and I want to know what you know. And uh, we developed a really cool friendship. He's just a just a generous, neat guy, um, super accomplished. Killed a lot of rams, drawn a lot of tags, done a lot of hunts, spent a lot of time chasing sheep, and just one of those guys where you can uh, you can definitely pick up a lot being around guys like that. He's uh, I believe he's 76 now. Um, he drew a bighorn tag in Montana in 2010, and I was fortunate enough to be able to help him out um, in an area that I knew really well, and he killed a 196-inch uh, big one um, together, and it was uh, just a great hunt one I'll always, always cherish. And, yeah, just a neat guy, you know, one of those one of those old old school guys, um, and I, I think Ray would take it as a as a compliment. Uh, he's an old timer, you know, he's he's been doing it for a long time. Uh, so yeah, just a just a really really neat guy and, and anybody who meets him knows how, how cool he is and uh yeah we've, we've had a, had some good hunts together and hopefully a few more yeah just a neat neat guy for sure you know one of the things i wanted to ask you about is in this day and age there's so much you know there's so many quote unquote experts out there giving advice and my question would be, how do you know what advice to take? Because it just seems like, you know, advice is just everywhere out there. Yeah, it is. Um, it is a funny time because uh, th there is a lot of guys out there that are so-called experts and stuff. And I, I, for me, the minimum to be an expert on something is you had to have done it. Um, there, there's, something I call <laughs> there's something I call conceptual knowledge. And everybody has an idea how things are going to work, and you have an idea of how you would implement something or, or what gear would work well. Um, I don't take advice from anybody that hasn't done it. Um, if I'm going to go on a hunt and I'm going to um, go into a country that I don't know about, I call a guy that's been there. I don't call somebody that thinks they know what would work really well, or I don't call a guy that you know would love to go do it. I uh, I, I, I talk to guys and, and get advice from guys that have done it. Um, Everybody's on their own journey, and and we all start somewhere. I mean, I like I said, I've I've been able to hunt sheep more than I ever would have dreamed, literally. Um, but you know, once you've been able to do it, it definitely changes your 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 mind and your opinion on stuff. I've I've had a, you know I I've had ideas of how things would work, and then when you go on a hunt, you go, man, that was a that was a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, any, you know, if you're going to get advice on doing, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on everything, and, and there's a lot of guys that know more than I do. Um, but I would say if you're, if you're going to get advice on whether it's sheep hunting or, or really anything, I talk to somebody that, that knows and, uh, and you know, pick the brain. You know, like I said, you know, you brought up Ray Alt. You know, I, I've got some, there's, there's some old guys. Um, I, I call, I'm, I'm headed in that direction as far as, uh, older guys, but, um, guys that have done it. I mean, there's, there's enough really good resources out there of guys that, that are accomplished and, uh, you may not see them on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that, but there, there are guys out there that, um, that know what they're talking about. And, you know, I would say if, you know, if somebody hadn't done it or hadn't been or hadn't accomplished what you want to accomplish or had, uh, you know, have 
don't have any experience doing it, I would uh, I would definitely go with somebody that's done it. That, that'd be my best advice. Yeah, no, I think that's good stuff. You know, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was this. Um, you know, it seems like there's this whole mentality out there that, uh, you know, is against, you know, I, I, I pride myself on being a trophy hunter and, and, and a quote unquote selective hunter and, and someone that really likes to evaluate animals and really likes to spend time looking and, you know, what makes this mule deer buck better than this one and what makes this coos deer, what, you know, what makes this ram you know, not only age, but characteristic of horn. And, you know, I, you know, everybody to each his own, but it seems like, you know, there's, there's several trains of thought out there, but then there's some people that, you know, quote unquote bag on, you know, maybe as much emphasis as I place on field judging and, and, you know, trophy scoring and what have you. And sometimes, isn't that just someone that maybe can't be uh, selective and doesn't have the ability to hold off on the trigger and go ahead and harvest a 13 and a half year old ram or a 15 year old ram like you harvested? You know, it's like, you know, there's this whole thing about, you know, uh, you know, I shot a five point bull and isn't that great? Well, yeah, in some cases, shooting a five point bull is fantastic. But then there's this, you know, if you go into a unit that's known for trophy bulls, what is wrong with pushing your own limits and hunting for 30 days and trying to harvest the best animal you can? I was just curious if you could weigh in on, on that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I, I think trophy hunting, the term, is probably does itself as much damage as anything. Um, you know, I'm looking for the biggest challenge, and we all are on a journey of, how we're going to get to, you know, our skill set and, and what we want to accomplish in hunting. And, um, and I think it's, it's people projecting where they're at at that particular time in their life on what other people can or cannot accomplish. For me, I don't like to hunt to end early. I, I'm looking for the biggest challenge. I mean, when I started elk hunting, my goal was just to get one. And on my first doll sheep, I just wanted a legal ram. Well, you know, as you, as you progress and you hunt sheep more and, you learn more about them and, and, and elk and sheep, you know, in my particular case, um, and you become more successful and you become um, more selective, uh, it becomes more fun. And the better you get at it, I mean, anybody who says they don't like to win is lying. I mean, we all want to get the biggest one. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's everybody's, you know, you, you got your personal journey that you're on. And, 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 and some guys, it's, you know, you just want to get one, and then you, the next stage is uh, you want to get a real good one and consistently get one, and then, you know, kind of when you get to the very, I guess when you get as as good as you can be, it's, you know, you're hunting specific animals and really big ones, and you're looking for the most challenging thing you can go after. And, uh, yeah, it's it's funny nowadays. I mean, the, the meat movement has been really cool to see, um, but I think a little bit's been lost in the fact that, uh, you know, Everybody, you know, it's it's illegal to not take the meat. You know, everybody eats the meat. It, it, it's not you're you're um, you're breaking the law. So there's it's it's not really like well I, just, you know, I just want to get one to fill the freezer or whatever. That that's great and that's excellent. I I love eating. You know, there's there's nothing puts a smile on my face right now than when I bust out the barbecue and and throw my 15 uh, year old doll sheep on there or my 13 year old big horn or a big old bull on there that that are excellent eating. Um, so yeah, it just boils down to. <clears throat> For me, it's more of a challenge. Um, uh, there was a time when just getting one was an absolutely incredible challenge for me. And as you get better and better, um, you get to the point where you're looking for the most the, the most challenging thing, which is being very selective and and hunting as long as possible. And, and part of it too is, you know, how long you want to hunt. Some guys just want to go out and get it done and 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 fill their tag and move on to the next thing. Uh, you know, a lot of times you're in a place where you just you just want to hunt as much as you can. Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer to that question. Uh, Brendan, I want to thank you for spending time with us here today. And I think we covered a lot of ground and had a great episode. And I uh, want to thank you for all the work that you do at KUYU. And, and I know you're an integral part of, of uh, a lot of these new products that we're seeing from KUYU. And I know you're always testing 
new stuff and, and running it through uh, the gauntlet, so to speak. And um, I just uh, love, love the, the stuff that's coming out of Kuyu and the innovation. And and uh, had Jason on oh, a couple weeks ago. And it's always great to have him on and, you know, have someone that's so focused on trying to make the best gear possible. And it's, you know, it's so fun to talk to him because you, you, you don't hear him talking about profit margins and you don't hear him talking about, you know, what would sell the best. He wants to make the best gear. And he thinks that if he does make the best gear, which he does, that it will sell itself. And I think that model, um, you know, it just, it's, it's a, that Kuyu model is one that, you know, years from now, everyone is going to be looking at Kuyu as, you know, a, a leader in their industry and, um, you know, trying to model their own company after what Kuyu has done. Um, so I want to thank you for being on and spending time and doing all of what you do. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, you, you said it best, and especially with Jason, you know, like, we're, we we like doing it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's not, it, it is work, but it's not. Um, you know, we're out there doing it and testing the stuff and building stuff for what we like to do. Um, and that's, you know, if you, if you keep an eye on that ball, everything else kind of follows. So it's, uh, yeah, it is fun. And, uh, you know, again, just uh, life is good, man. Right on, buddy. We'll see. Sounds good. Until I talk to you next time, God bless. And, uh, uh, oh, what do you got going? Uh, do you have anything specific already planned for this fall? I uh, Yes, I do. I just got a, got a couple more doll sheep hunts on the go on this fall. Um, doing one in the Yukon and one in Alaska, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how those go. Um, yeah, it should be an interesting year. I'm hoping to, you know, I'm in every drawing everywhere in the West, like I said, so maybe there'll be one more tag coming somewhere else, but... Uh, yeah, if not, we got uh, deer, elk, and antelope, all the good stuff here in Montana, so uh, already shaping up to be a pretty good year. So, Awesome, buddy. Sounds good. Well, God bless. I'll catch you later. Thanks, Jay. Have a good one. Right.